So we've, we've mentioned uh, low carbon. I think I mentioned uh, seeing Al Gore speak uh, back in 2006, which for me was when this whole idea of climate crisis and, and uh, to some extent, um, the state that the planet had, has, has, uh, has come into, uh, first kind of came into my consciousness as being like, this is a big deal. Uh, what's been great is that the Northeast has actually had a lot of leadership uh, in, this, in this field, particularly in things, things like low emission vehicles uh, and, and such like. And our, our, if I remember correctly, uh, the, is, it, is the Nissan Leaf created here? Yeah, so the Nissan Leaf, as some of you may know, is an electric car. I saw one on the way in here today as well, uh, and plugged into one of the, uh, the charging outlets uh, here in Newcastle. Uh, it's built uh, just, down, uh, just down the road in Sunderland. So. Uh, our next two speakers are from a company called Zero Carbon Futures. Uh, they are uh, Dr. Colin Heron and Josie Wardle, and they're here to tell us a little bit about their work, which takes place in Gateshead mostly. Is that right? Could you welcome them to our stage, please? Ah, there we are. Um, there's a little bit of continuity here because we actually both work for One Northeast. When One Northeast closed, we managed to get a loan of um, £50,000 from Gateshead College and we created our company. We do make some money. Uh, any money that we make is actually taken off us at the end of the year and goes for educating people like yourselves at the college. So that's what we do. The reason I put this photograph up is that it was great to see ourselves downstairs, but as my daughter pointed out, it's great to see somebody who's in a museum and still alive. <laughs> okay, so now this is over to me. We're a bit of a little and large double act, um, which you'll get used to over time. Um, my name's Josie Wardle. I'm a manufacturing engineer. I'm also a mum. Um, and I'm also a PhD student for my sins in my spare time. Um, interestingly, I came to engineering from a very different background to Danielle, for instance. I came from an old girls' school where we didn't do any engineering topics, no design, no metalwork, no woodwork. So probably, understandably, I wasn't even thinking about a career in engineering until a lady engineer came to our school to talk to us at a careers day about what her job was all about. And basically, she got me hooked on the idea of a career in engineering. So I took a pretty unusual route for a grammar school girl. I actually, after school, went and did an apprenticeship in British Aerospace. We made military aircraft, um, the Typhoon and the like, and the Hawk and the Harrier and the things like that. Basically, I worked on them. Maybe if you've been to the Lake District on your holidays and you've been lucky enough or unlucky enough to be out and about when those very low-flying uh, planes come overhead, basically, that's my fault. That's what I worked on. But it kind of puts things into context. Because since then, so I've worked on these massive, huge, technologically advanced, loud uh, fighter planes and since then, I've worked on the opposite end of the scale, plastic boxes, via computers, then into cars, and now into electric vehicles, which are silent as silent can be, and the opposite extreme to those fighter planes. And basically, I love it, as you can probably tell. Now over to Colin. My life was, uh, I was brought up in Wall's End, Dad worked in the shipyards, industry which unfortunately is now gone. Um, I was an abject failure at school. I was asked to leave after my what was then O levels, of which I didn't have many. For some reason, school completely passed me by. I started an apprenticeship like Josie, and then I went through education the hard way. I did everything through night class, I did open university, part-time, and then I did a PhD part-time. I've actually ended up with a grand title at Newcastle University as a visiting professor of practice, because apparently I do know a little bit about what I'm talking about, so it's said. What we want to talk about today, and you may think that's a Formula One car, it is, but it's electric. People always think electric cars are milk floats. They've now reached this level of technology, which is a lot different from what used to be. 
In the top corner is the first electric cars. Henry Ford actually produced them, and they were around 1912. So there was a big battle, would cars have engines or would cars not have engines? And then we got some really sexy ones like the Gee Whiz. Not surprisingly, not many people bought them, and they didn't go very far. The next bit which came up was the leaf. And there's a bit of a story about the leaf which concerns me. I had a guy up from London, from the Department for Business, and we were sitting in a pub, which I tend to do quite a bit with visitors, and we were talking about the fact that Nissan were looking for somewhere to build the leaf. Now, although they have a factory in Sunderland, that wasn't the first choice. We suddenly realized that Portugal and Renault factories were competing for it. Now, knowing the history that we've got here for electricity, Parsons, and all those things, we made a concerted effort to get that vehicle into the Northeast because it would be a huge loss if we didn't. But we also knew if the vehicle come, the battery would come as well. And with the battery, you can do an awful lot as we hear as we go on. But in order for people to understand what an electric vehicle is and to understand that they can genuinely buy one and use one for their everyday lives, we needed to provide an infrastructure. There are other things that needed to go with the production of the car to persuade people to buy them. So fundamentally, we're all used today to driving petrol or diesel cars, maybe a few biogas cars, and we're used to going to petrol stations and filling up with diesel or unleaded petrol. An electric car, of course, doesn't need any of those things, but it does have a pretty big battery that needs charging instead much bigger battery than what we try to keep charged up overnight on our phones or our iPads or things like that. But there was nowhere to do this. It's not like using your normal three-pin plug and plugging it into the wall. It needs a bit more dedicated supply than that. So we needed to create a network of really visible, highly obvious charge points all over the region so that customers like your parents, like yourselves in a few years to come, would know that if you bought an electric vehicle, you could charge it up somewhere. So that's what we did. We went out and we provided a whole regional infrastructure of charge points, much like this one, lovingly known as Bob, who's in the museum downstairs. Um, blue flashing lights, you see them all over. Hopefully, you've seen some of them either in our city centres, in our big car parks, at places like the Metro Centre, at leisure centres, places like that. So people like yourselves could understand that this was electric and it was possible for you to consider buying an electric car rather than a petrol or diesel car in the future. But the other thing that we needed to do alongside providing these charge points was bust a load of myths. I always say that wrong, sorry. Like the milk float idea, for instance. When we talk to people, even today, five, six years after we started doing this, they still think an electric vehicle, a lot of people still think electric vehicle goes really slowly, it's got no acceleration, it makes that horrible buzzing sound, just like a milk float. This just isn't the case, as you've seen from the uh, pictures Colin's already shown you. So we did an awful lot of campaigns uh, on the radio, uh, in the papers, on buses, um, in big billboards around the region, telling people what electric vehicles were like, how they could use them, and how they could make a real difference to their lives. And then we had a really good moment. Nissan made the decision to build the car in the northeast, and I was fortunate in February 2011, I went down and the ship came in and the first 60 all-electric LEAF appeared for sale. That was the first point, it was a bit of celebration and people could for the first time get in them, see, drive and feel them. However, one of the things that you may have seen a little bit of controversy about emissions on the TV at the moment. So the best way to solve your vehicle emission problems is not to have emissions. What we've seen in cities now is that emissions are a problem. Pollution is a problem. Health is a problem. In this picture of the lady with the mask on, if you go down to London, you will see it. Sometimes I think it's a fashion accessory. However, 
Last year, I went to Beijing for a conference on electric vehicles, surprisingly. And that is a real picture of people running the Beijing Marathon. 30% of the people walked away from the start, because if you can see in the background, you'll pick up, you can't actually see the buildings because of the smog. So this is a real problem which has to be addressed. Cities are changing rapidly, and we will find that, I think it's by about 2060, 75% of the world's population will live in cities. The more people that go into cities, the more they want to drive, the more pollution will appear. Okay, so the other key point to make is that this is not just a car. A car or an electric vehicle isn't just something for driving around in anymore. It's got lots of other uses and also it gives us lots of opportunities for the future as engineers, as scientists, as software, as designers to make new things that will interface with electric vehicles. Bottom line is you can talk to your car from your phone. So for instance, lying in bed in the morning on a cold winter's morning, you can stay under your duvet, using your phone, you can switch your car on and get it to warm up so that in half an hour's time when you're ready to go out, your car's lovely and toasty and all defrosted. I wish I'd done that this morning, I have to say. Anyway, I wouldn't have been late if that was the case. Um, and similarly, as you're driving around, you can check how efficiently you're driving. So how much charge have you got left? How many miles out have you got of the chat? Have you how many miles have you got out of the charge that you've used up? And if you're sitting in your supermarket doing your shopping or in a cafe having your coffee and your car's on charge, you can keep an eye on how much charge you've got and so what time you're going to leave, whether you'll be ready to go on your phone. So there's hundreds of opportunities for app development in that whole sphere and more smart technologies to be put into the car so that we as users have a much easier way of life. But the other side of this smartness is that actually we can use our cars to now power the equipment in our homes. So for instance, you could use the battery and the power in that battery from your car to power your telly, to power your iPad, to power your phone overnight. The reverse of what we're used to without taking any energy from the grid. And these are where the opportunities for the future really lie. And they're right here in the northeast where we make the batteries and we make the cars. Can I say on that last point about the cars running off the house, that all started from the big Japan earthquake in 2011. What they realized was when they immediately lost power, there was a possibility to use the vehicles to charge the house so that people who desperately need electricity on dialysis or whatever actually had a viable backup source. So that's where that technology came from. The next bit, which is often misquoted as driverless cars or autonomous vehicles. This is great fun, and the government is pushing a lot of money to do it. We are trying to get some demonstrations in the region. The picture on here deliberately shows the steering wheel at the people's back as the vehicle goes along. This May, I was, in, um, I was in Japan, I was at Nissan's headquarters, and I was at an expo and I had an actual video of a guy came out of their headquarters and he held his hands like this, and the steering wheel was here, and he put his hands like this. He came out the headquarters, he went onto the road, he went onto a Japanese freeway, and he mixed with the traffic he came off the freeway, he came all the way back in, and he parked the car. They never showed his face as he did it, because that could have been really interesting. But what it showed is the technology is actually there. I don't think we'll ever be in a situation where people are actually in the pure driverless, but I think there will always be a human in there. And one of the reasons that we're bringing this in is, as I am an example, being in a museum, is that people are actually living longer and longer and longer. And in the old days, people used to retire and buy their last car. Now what the car industry is realizing, and people want to be mobile when they're 70, 75, 80, and 85. Then the Japanese have got a lot of people over 100. But if you want to continue driving and being mobile, 
you have to have a level of autonomy to let the vehicle make some thought for you. And this is the next opportunity coming out. And this brings in all the technology you've heard spoken this morning. This is where digital really comes in, and satellites and communication. So those people who are putting satellites up there with GPS had better get it right. So, in summary, we think the North is a really, really exciting place to work. We love it here. Colin's from here, I'm not, but it's my absolute adopted home. It's the home of electricity, as many people have said already and you'll hear more about today. So it's great that we've been able to build a new electric vehicle economy on the back of all of that, which is continuing to grow. And now we're so lucky that people from all over the world, Japan included, come over here to see what we've done in the Northeast to understand how they can go away and replicate it in their own parts of the world. What an amazing place to be. Just to so we are actually, when we leave here, we're going to Newcastle University because we are finalizing for tomorrow a bid and the bid is to become a, UV, a UK EV accelerator city, where we're bidding for money to put all new ideas in. And some of the ideas are really novel. So for instance, if you're driving an EV and you come to the traffic lights and the traffic lights are on red, they will be moving to green. So there's all sorts of sensors, technology, air monitoring, all part of this bid will be going all across the city. So not only will you see charge points, It'll be in the press if we win it. So at the moment, that's, that's what we see as the future, and that's what we're going to work on this afternoon. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so Thanks so much, Matt. Um, just a, uh, a couple, just a, a one or two quick questions. Um, so I've got, I've got two diesel vehicles that I own. Uh, on the band of both of them, no, they're not. They're not the Volkswagens on the basis that uh, they were supposedly relatively environmentally friendly. But our diesels just, but now in reading the press, it seems that actually diesel are, are even with like blue tech technology and things like that, uh, that they're still basically quite bad for the environment, ultimately. Well, the way to look at it, and said lots of people are doing physics, if you burn a hydrocarbon, you're going to give off emissions at some point. Yeah. So there is a theoretical minimum you can go, mm -hmm. or you have to cheat. So what we're advocating is solve the problem and yeah. just don't use them. Okay. But they will be here for a long time Yeah. because you will have diesel hybrids, petrol hybrids as we move forward. So there is a use for them now, but we just have to recognize the fact, yes, they're polluting. Okay. Um, you mentioned autonomous vehicles towards the end of your, uh, to the end of your talk. Is it, I mean, I don't know where you guys, I know I realize it's always very difficult to do futurology, especially on stage, but, uh, is it, is it likely that we'll just skip from this current, obviously the current, if you will, uh, uh, convention of petrol and diesel cars primarily, and just skip ultimately to autonomous vehicles? No. So, so, so we will, we'll, okay, go ahead. The way it's been designed is, is there's three phases. So if you're driving in a motorway, the first level of autonomy is that you stay in the lane that you're in. Mm -hmm. The second level of autonomy is the car can move between the lanes and know where it is. Mm -hmm. The third level of autonomy is it can come to a junction and go across the junction. Mm -hmm. That was going to take stages till 2020, 2025. Right, okay. Yeah. Are we eventually going to get to a point though where it'll be totally autonomous? Like I just get in the car. Like and, iRobot. Or something like that. I, it will be that way. But you will always be in there for safety reasons. Right. Because I can always see some clever person jumping out in front of them just to stop them. Not that anybody here would ever think that would be a bit, bit of fun, mm -hmm. but that's the obvious thing to do, because they'll have to have sensors, and if anybody's in front, they will stop. So we'll always have a driver who will be allowed to make the ultimate decision. Cool. I wish we had more time to talk, because this is a fascinating topic, but thank you very, very much. Okay? Cheers. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.